Well, welcome to another episode of the Gospel Forum Podcast. My name is Dan Sardinas, and I'm here with my friends Nick Pilgrim and Shane, and we are a collective of Reformation-minded Christians. You can check out more information about the Gospel Forum on our website, thegospelforum.com, and make sure you subscribe and leave a honest five-star review on iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. The only place honesty will lead you. Honesty will lead you is five stars. Five stars yeah. Yes, Amen. yes. All right. So how's it going, gentlemen? Uh, it's interesting. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. I'm good. I don't have a new baby, but... Yeah, baby. congratulations to Shane and his yeah. wife, Stephanie. I do have a new baby. Introduce the gospel form. Yeah. Because we, we did say, on the, one of the last episodes you were on, we did say that you were, uh, that, that you guys were expecting. A, a baby. Yeah. Now she's here. That was the resurrection episode, I think. Yes. Yeah, good. Catherine Jane. We're calling her Kate. Awesome. So, it's baby Kate. Baby Kate. Here, healthy, happy, you know, doing her normal thing, sleeping and pooping and eating and if you have babies you know exactly what doing the baby about. thing if so you she... don't have babies you're kind of like oh that's that's what it's like but so does she look more like you or more like your wife she kind of looks like a baby right now yeah. but yeah. um so like a necessary an, stage so like an alien no she's actually she, nick she is the cutest oh she, nick. i've seen her and she's right? super cute and she's got these big eyes. She's always alert. That one picture, she literally looks like a doll baby. Like, you have to, like, zoom in. You're like, wait a second. Yeah, she's adorable. Oh, that is a real baby. <laughs> yeah. Follow me if you want an influx of baby pictures. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Well, we're also recording this episode uh, via video, so make sure if you want to see how our beautiful mugs look like, go to thegospelforum.com or our Facebook page Hi, Mom. or YouTube page to see this uh, episode also vi via video. Well, guys, let's go to our main topic of the day, shall we? And today we're talking about what, Shane? Law. Huh. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Wait, but that's not true. We're going to get... We're going to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's based on an old song, uh, War, War, What's It Good For? Absolutely Nothing. So we decided to title this episode, Law, Law, What Is It Good For? And so uh, many people think absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think most Christians, uh, although... Well, I think Nick's going to say something different here. Um, uh, most Christians, I think, aren't antinomian. Uh, well, yeah, I, I do agree. I, I don't think they're antinomian. Antinomian, but they speak like one. Uh, yeah, I think most Christians are legalists. And antinomian, let's just define some words here. Anti-law. Anti-law, yeah. meaning law, law, what's it good for? Absolutely yeah. nothing. Okay. Or, or and, lawless, if you will. Or lawless. Yeah. And I think typically when people go that route, they have a fear of the law. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, oh, well, I'm saved by grace. You know, I can't work my way to heaven, so what, yeah. what good is the law for? Yeah. Amen. Of course, we agree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I think we should be afraid of the law because it brings condemnation, uh, and which we'll we'll see here in a minute. But but yeah, like in one sense, we should be afraid of the law in that regard. But is that the only use of the law? No. And there are there are uses of the law, and at least three. At least three good ones. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I guess let's just dig down deep into it. And I'm actually reading from a Ligonier article um, that uh, defines uh, how Calvin used the law in a threefold sense. The first function that Ligonier sends, says is to be a mirror, yeah. which reflects to us both the perfect righteousness of God and our own sinfulness and shortcomings. Hmm. What does that mean? Um, to start, the law is just a display of God's character. So God does not murder. God does not lie. We see in Hebrews where it says that it is impossible for God to lie. Or Paul writing to Timothy, it is impossible for God to deny himself. Why would it be impossible for God to de deny himself? Well, because he is truth and it is impossible for him to lie. So for him to deny himself would be to lie. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone to deny God would be to lie, but that's our apologetics episode. So, <laughs> right. um, but then, uh, but when we compare ourselves to God or the law, then we see our own shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Calvin actually stated it very clearly in 
his institutes, he says, man is never duly touched and impressed with the dread of being, um, fi or being filled with dread and magnificence simultaneously mm -hmm. when they compare themselves to God because they look at who God is and his beautiful, wonderful majesty, but then they think to themselves, uh-oh, I don't match up to that. Mm -hmm. And God's word says, be perfect as I am perfect. Right, right. And so Pilgrim, the law, like he says, is a mirror. So it's, it allows us to see who we truly are yeah. according to God's standard, which is what the law is. It's God's standard, God's character, revelation of himself. Yeah. So how, 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 how can a sinner look at the law and say, wow, uh, I mean, like, what, what, what good does that do for a person who sees their sin? Well, I think in a lot of ways, you know, just to use a, an analogy, if we were to be driving down the road and we are completely oblivious to a speed limit, even existing, so we're, which by definition is a, a law, a local, you know, civic law, a, a traffic law. We're driving along. Uh, we have no idea that there's a school. We have no idea there's a school zone. There's a crossing guard. There's children at risk. And here we are going along 95 miles an hour. We're just enjoying our day. And then the police pull us over. The lights are in our rear view mirror. The policeman approaches the car. We put our window down and he says, you know, license and registration. And we're going, what is going on? We hand him our license and registration. And then he proceeds to look at it and say, you know what, citizen? I just want you to know that the police force loves you and has a wonderful plan for your day. We just want you to have a wonderful time out there. Wow. I would be frustrated. Why are yeah. you slowing me down? Right. You're impeding the joy of my day. And like this is this is an embarrassment and, a, and an infringement upon my freedoms. Mm -hmm. What we don't realize is that the law has been posted that I'm supposed to keep under a certain you know speed limit, and I have put myself and other people at risk because of my transgression of the law by breaking yeah. the law. So what the law does, what the law of God does, it reveals in that mirror. It shows us mm -hmm. our condemnation, our great need mm -hmm. for salvation, and so we really have no leg to stand on to just say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life if we don't first, you know, in other words, the glory of the gospel isn't really understood until we first see the, the realization that we've violated a holy God, that we've transgressed his law. And so I think, you know, that's just a silly example. No, it's a good uh, one. Right. No, we don't one. understand that there's good news if we didn't realize that there was bad news to begin with. Exactly. And, you know, the there's a big difference between the cop pulling you over and saying, hey, just wanted to let you know that we hope you have a wonderful day and you've got a great plan for your life, or saying, well, I was going to nab you for 25 over, but I'm going to show you some mercy and grace and let you off on this one. Well, those are two different uh, stories, and I think a lot of times that's why in our current time, in our current culture, it's very easy for people to say, well, no, I mean, I'm, the, I'm glad that works for you. I'm glad this is something that you enjoy or you get something out of, but I don't really see a need for it. I, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me because, well, maybe, maybe they feel like they have a wonderful plan for their own life and things are going just fine because we haven't shown them th themselves up to the mirror of right. God's law. Mm. Yeah, like Romans chapter 7, verse 7 says, What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. And so that's, you know, mm -hmm. and he goes on and talks about uh, covetousness specifically. Right. Um, but the law in itself, it reveals to us. It brings the knowledge of sin. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, like running with that Romans 7 passage, it ends after kind of wrestling with the law, I think where we need to bring people to end, where Paul actually says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of the sin. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Mm. And I think that's where we need to use the law because... <laughs> we got some background noise. That's okay. Uh, wow, just construction going on. Um, that's As you're constructing your own narrative here. Very nice. I like that transition. <laughs> but we need to bring people to that question mm -hmm. when we're giving them the law is, who will deliver me? Yes. Right. Because what happens if we don't do that is we, and you can see this subculture, unfortunately yeah. it's becoming the normative culture in Christianity, 
where there's no repentance in, in a gospel presentation. So it's add Jesus to your list of things that you like. Right. So I yeah. self-identify now as a Christian versus, no, I'm going to mm-hmm. turn from my sin. I'm going to die to you know the law, die to the old mm-hmm. man. I'm going to now put on Christ and you know I'm repenting and turning in faith to Jesus. It's just I have a you know list of things I like to do, and Jesus is one of them. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Add Jesus to your secular worldview. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Syncretism. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and I think, again, when most people say that they're, you know, that the law isn't good for anything, I think they're thinking of just being saved. Like yeah. Romans 3.20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his yeah. sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Yeah. And so obviously that's not what we're talking. But without the law, how do you know you even need to be saved? How do you yeah. even know you're under condemnation? Well, well, the second half of that verse you just read, normally people just quote the first half. Well, we're not saved by works. Well, agreed, you're not saved yeah. by your works. Right. Uh, but the second half says mm-hmm. the law brings knowledge of sin. So mm-hmm. what are you saved from? Well, you're saved from God's wrath due unto your sin. Well, what's my sin? Ah, thanks for thanks for mm-hmm. asking. Mm-hmm. Do you uh, have you ever murdered anyone? No, I've never killed anyone. Mm-hmm. Well, have you ever hated anyone? Jesus said, if you've ever hated anyone, you've committed murder in your heart. Well, well, I've I, I've you know I, I've hated you know someone before. Oh, okay. Well, have you ever committed adultery? No, I've never done that. Well, have you ever lusted? Yeah. Uh, so you know the application of that law to someone's right. life. Is, is the second half mm-hmm. of that very verse. That's right. It's God's world, right? So it is God's world. We, we have to play by God's rules, and by mm-hmm. nature, we break those rules yeah. and go contrary to him. So, yeah, uh, uh, Augustine said, um, the law bids us as we try to fulfill its requirements and become wearied in our weakness under it to know how to ask the help of grace. And so when we come to the knowledge that we fall way short of the demands of the law, that's where we go, oh, wow, I need grace. I need something else to fix this, to remedy this, or I'm in big trouble. And so there is a balance of law and gospel, yes. right? There is a balance of law and gospel, law and grace. And so just those, you know, if you're focusing on the law, it doesn't make you a legalist. It's, it's actually make, making you a good balanced gospel person to realize I need Jesus to satisfy all the requirements requirements that this has now been made known to me. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Luther said, you may preach the law ever so fervently. If the preaching of the gospel does not accompany it, the law will never produce true conversion and heartfelt repentance. We do not mean to say that the preaching of the law is without value, but it only serves to bring home to us the wrath of God. Yeah, yeah. amen. amen. So and it, and, and another, another point where uh, a lot of people only quote half a verse is uh, Romans 6 uh, said, mm-hmm. uh, Verse 15 says, What then? Are we to sin because uh, we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Well, right there it says we're not under law but we're under grace. Mm-hmm. Well, the whole point of that is not to say, uh, not to put a dichotomy or a, to, you know, make law and grace as warring against each other, but the verse right before it says, For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Right. The, the war is not between grace and law. The war is between grace and the dominion of sin. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. yeah. So that's the first use. The second use is the civil use um, as defined here. And it says the civil use is to restrain evil. Through, though the law cannot change the heart, it can to some extent inhibit lawlessness by its threats of judgment, especially when backed by a civil code that administers punishment for proven offenses. Thus, it secures civil order and serves to protect the righteous from the unjust. Yeah. And so we have, a, we have laws um, in just about every country that says it's wrong to murder. Yeah. It's wrong to steal, right? Um, and so you just can't go take something else that doesn't belong to you. Yeah. You have to, you know, you, you can't do well, that. Not only that it's wrong, but you will be punished. You will be punished. If you don't, if you break this right. law. Right. And so this is this is just this is even ingrained into human society. He's written his law in our hearts. That's right. Yeah. And so this is biblical. (laughs) It does. I think think there's um, some misunderstanding here, and I've talked to a lot of Christians as a pastor who get really hung up on this part of it. Um, Mm -hmm. 
not not necessarily the ceremonial use, but the but the civil idea. Um, and the way I always try to liken it is like kind of like a horse's bridle um, given to a young rebellious nation. So in the same way you have you just had a baby, mm-hmm. you kind of baby proof your house. So be ready for this when you guys do this. So you got to buy like all this like special plastic ware to put into the 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 plugs. You have to take stuff up, you know, several flights. You know, mm-hmm. at least at least eight feet, six feet high. Four feet high. Everything's got to be up off the, you know, the lower area. My wife then figured out that that works for me hiding donuts. You know, <laughs> I no longer eat them if they're hidden. But mm-hmm. um, you look at the, like this nation of Israel as a young nation, and so there's a lot of like civil mm-hmm. laws that made sense for a very undeveloped or very newly formed um, people. And um, as they grew, um, we know in scriptures we are children of Abraham by faith. And so ultimately we're adopted into his family. So most of those civil laws aren't necessarily things that we would follow today. Just like in Detroit, there used to be a law that says banana peels are not to be thrown onto the street. It was actual law for fear of um, horses slipping, you know? And so that's not something we would necessarily adopt today. Is that still on the books? I think it is. In Florida, it is still illegal to tie up your pet alligator outside of a saloon. Well, that's good to know. Next if time we could I find a saloon, a saloon <laughs> with your pet alligator in the middle of the state somewhere. Um, but I think that's important. You know, like to think through that that there are certain um, aspects mm-hmm. of civil laws that mm-hmm. applied specifically to a young nation, um, Israel at that time. But that doesn't necessarily apply. You know, well, in and a they right, sense. and they serve. You know, the the three. Uh, divisions of the law, I guess we could say, is the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, the civil law, which are laws that were for Israel, specifically to keep them separate from the other nations. They were God's yeah. people. You will be holy. You will be, be different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. Right. I mean, those type of things. Um, and then, of course, then you have the, the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law has been fulfilled in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right, the civil law. God now has a people called the church right. that are called to be holy and separate and, and distinct from it, the world. But those are typically when I talk to people, that's what they're bringing up. They're bringing up some of those really obscure. Right. Oh, you can't moments. eat shellfish. Right. 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 Your hair shouldn't touch your nape of your neck or don't yeah. mix. Yeah. Don't mix two fabrics. different fabrics. Yeah. yeah. Put in so, a broader sense. Have right. a cheeseburger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but we could still see the character and nature of God in that. Yeah. Yes. And that He's what holy. That he's set apart, and that is the main thing. That that's why those things were uh, given to Israel, because you'll be my people, you'll be a kingdom of priests, you'll show me to the world. And of course, they failed miserably at that. <laughs> um, and so, but anyway, not that the church does much better. But uh, so anyway, so that's the second one. I mean, can you just imagine if we didn't have God's law as a restrainer of evil? How much more? Uh, wicked and and perverse our world would well, be. Well, that's hell. Yeah, There's I no mean, re- no restraint of God. As bad as it is, God's law, even ingrained into societies, does act as a restrainer. It could be worse. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, so it's, so it's used for a for a that that that's the second use, the civil use. Anything else on that one? No. Okay. And then the third use is um, uh, what Ligonier says here is to guide the regenerate. Uh, those who are saved, born again, into the good works that God has planned for them. The law tells God's children what will please their Heavenly Father. It could be called their family code. Christ was speaking of this third use of the law when he said that those who became his disciples must be taught to do all that he has commanded. They're in the Great Commission. Um, And that obedience to his commands will prove the reality of one's love for him. Uh, That's when Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The Christian is free from the law as a system of salvation, but is under the law of Christ as a rule of life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so really, I guess what we could say here is that the third use of the law, uh, in a sense, guides our sanctification. It shows us what God is like and how we are to be Christ-like and godly in that way. Yeah, yeah Kevin DeYoung said salvation is not the reward for obedience, it's the reason for obedience. Mm, right. So because we're saved, because we're justified, we are now made right with the Father because of the finished work of Christ. Um, you know, like Nick was kind of saying a minute ago, we are saved by good works. It's not our own good works. It's by Christ's mm. good work. He did fulfill the law. So by yeah. him fully keeping the law of God, 
and dying in our place as our substitute, we now have full forgiveness, pardon, salvation. So now the guilty one goes free and we're, we're free to um, live obediently. And, and yeah, the Spirit of God is sanctifying us. Mm-hmm. And, and we look at Mark's scripturally, mm-hmm. like Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. I look for these marks in my own sanctification. I want to be growing, as Second Peter 1 says, I'm adding to my faith knowledge and goodness and brotherly kindness and love, and I'm increasing in these areas. And if I don't, right. he says in Second Peter 1, that I'm nearsighted and blind. I have myopia. I don't even realize that I've been yeah. cleansed from my past sins. I might even begin acting like I was prior to Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, So it's so important that I, these are not things that save me, right. but these are things that help encourage me or sometimes discourage me when I see how I'm not progressing in my sanctification. But these should be things where I can say, yes, Lord, I'm growing in that area. Thank you, Lord. Well, they're also evidences, yeah. I think, in a way that you do belong to Christ. Yeah. Like Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That doesn't say keep my commandments in order to love me. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But by the fact that you obey me and keep my commandments, he's saying it will be proof that you do love me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it, it kind of guides our, our conscience, our uh, our hearts to say, yeah, we do belong to him. This is where my... my Right. my 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 uh, desires are um, Jane did you want to say something yeah I mean I, I like to break this down into the law says do mm-hmm. the gospel says done so we're not called then to live the gospel no and you probably have heard that before we're you gonna can't. live the go- you can't live the gospel um, so we're not called to, to live the gospel we're called to believe the gospel yeah. but now mm-hmm. We're also called to follow the law in light of God's mercy and love and forgiveness that he has given us. And I love what Pilgrim said about how we're kind of freed now mm-hmm. yeah. from that. It reminds me Galatians chapter 5, yeah. for you, uh, verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. But here's what he says, only do not use your freedom as, freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Mm-hmm. So... We're not under the obligation of the law. Right. It's not, we're not in the old covenant where it was keep the law and live. We're right. in the new covenant. You are going to live, mm-hmm. and I'm going to lead you and guide you, and you're going to keep the law because I'm going to write it on your heart. And so now take this and love one another. Mm-hmm. Take this and serve one another. Don't use it as an opportunity to gratify yourself or to elevate yourself. Mm-hmm. Use it as an opportunity to say, Man, look what look what God did for me. Look what Jesus Christ did for me. Mm-hmm. Now let me go out and just do a small, tiny picture, a little fraction of that mm-hmm. for others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I like what uh, Hebrews 8 says, uh, talking about uh, Jesus is the high priest that brings about this better covenant. Uh, quoting from Jeremiah 31, it says, um, uh, For this is the covenant that I will make the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. Mm. You know, as Shane, you know, had mentioned earlier, you know, that the law is written on the heart of the believer. Now, now, it's on the heart of all mankind, but it's made new. It, it's it's almost like that covenant is not only renewed uh, in the sense that it's it's the same covenant, but it, it's it's vibrant now it's technicolor well yeah so you know the law of moses was external written on tablets yes now in the new covenant it's written upon our hearts and that ezekiel passage or jeremiah passage that speaks about the new covenant Mm -hmm. god says i will cause you to walk in my ways i will cause you to i mean it's so beautiful so before it was required for outward obedience to like, oh, okay, I got it. But now God does it in us, through yeah. us, yeah. Yeah. and gives us uh, the desires. He changes our affections for yeah. him. Um, I mean, what a beautiful picture that is. Yeah. And so even when we keep the law, obey the law, it's in the power and authority of Christ. Yeah. It's through his... We finish. still can't point to ourselves. Right. It's we still have through, to point. The, it's through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, well, it's like what uh, Romans 8 says. You know, a lot of times, you know, people use it in talking about, like, the depth of the sin of man. Mm-hmm. But the point of the passage is to say that we are all re- still required to fulfill the law. Right. But the mind that is set upon the flesh cannot do it. It mm-hmm. does not do it. It rebels against it. And it says, indeed, it cannot. 
Right. So what's it saying there? It's actually saying that God requires unbelievers to fulfill his law, people that are unable to. And, mm. and a lot of people will say, well, that's not fair to say that God requires people that are unable to fulfill the law to do it. But the whole point of that is to demonstrate that you can't do it. Mm. You need someone else. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, you know, speaking to the very confused Galatians who had a lot of outside influence, you know, says in chapter three, verse one, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he goes on to say, um, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Um, Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So yeah. it's still by faith. We're not we're not min- diminishing that. We're not saying okay, the Christian life is now lived by the law. It's by faith. Mm-hmm. But what we're saying is the spirit of Christ actually empowers the believer so that we fulfill the law. Not I don't want to say accidentally, but we realize God is doing this in and through us. It's a like a cool story. I know isn't a lot of sermon fodder, but you know it's probably not a true story. But this woman finds this. Um, husband and he's just like a taskmaster and he's just demanding all these things Um, and she grows to hate him he dies and then she finds in the attic one day as she's newly married to this amazing guy she finds one of his lists Mm. all these things that you know he demanded her to do well now she found herself recounting that list um, and she had been doing those things for her new husband you know just motivated by love not motivated by law so i guess that's kind of what we're saying is it's the motivation yeah. is ultimately by faith right because we're now you know the work has been done it's been paid and i, I like what you said there Motiv- motivated mo- motivated motivated, motivated. <laughs> my wife's gonna make word of the me. day yeah, motivated, motivated. motivated. Uh, Hi, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. um you know motivated by love but love and law are paired at mm. that point because well, be- so many times people want to make those as two different things that you either love or you do the law but jesus paired them together you quoted it a couple times dan uh saying that if you love me you will obey my commands well it's it's not saying you know you pointed out earlier it's not saying well uh if you obey my commands then you can earn my love right no it's saying like start by loving me and you're going to do these things Mm -hmm. um you know and uh, book I read a little bit ago uh, I think I've even mentioned it on the podcast uh, The Law and the Gospel by Ernie Reisinger uh, there's a section in there he was saying that uh, that love and law are together uh, but they not only work together but they're complementary because love cannot be its own definition mm-hmm. love needs a definition and the definition of love is the law well why do you honor your mother and father because you love them why do you not steal from others because you love them mm-hmm. why do you not take the lord's name in vain because you love him because right. you're motivated by exactly yeah. you know and awesome and, it, and it's amazing that you know modern mm-hmm. movements mm-hmm. you know use love it's its own definition now mm-hmm. you hear love is love mm-hmm. well if i said doorstop is doorstop you would think i'm speaking nonsense but yet <laughs> In this, they're they're trying to use yeah. love as its own definition rather than law as the definition for love, mm, and law. love is the motivation for law. The mm. law is love, and the law is good. Yes. And Spurgeon says there is nothing in the law of God that will rob you of happiness. It only denies you that which would cost you sorrow. Yeah. So God has given us this law now because He loves us and because He desires good for us and good for others and so that's how we have to really walk in that obedience mm-hmm. not because we're looking for ourselves but because god's best it, god's love is really best translated through his law and through what he has given us amen can i make one more point on that the same exact point is this is not just a new testament thing this this has always been the case you look at the way the uh, ten commandments are structured well, a lot of people think, okay, well, it starts with, you know, uh, you know, you know, you shall not have other gods before me. But there, there's a verse right before that. It says, uh, and God spoke to them with these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So this is God's love is being poured out on them. Mm-hmm. And then he defines how his love is to look. Mm-hmm. That, that reciprocated love uh, back to him is to look like it start it, it has always started with love mm. yeah and first john 5 3 this verse is just right here for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and mm-hmm. his commandments are not burdensome yeah so without the law we have no gospel mm. right yeah. 
without the law, we would have nothing for us to look into and say, I'm a sinner, I failed, I need God's grace. Without the law, there would be more evil in the world as Certainly. the restraining factor would be gone. And as Christians, we would not know how to, to what a Christ-like um, example truly is to live by. Yeah. Um, the law of Christ, even that Paul speaks of in Galatians 6 two, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah. yeah, Christians are committed commanded to fulfill the law, to keep yeah. the law. Uh, but of course, in a much different way than most people anticipate. Yeah. Another good resource on this is um, a book called uh, The Whole Christ. Yeah, so I was just going to recommend that. The yeah. Whole Christ by uh, Sinclair Ferguson. Uh, it could be a little bit of a deeper read for some, but it is an yeah. excellent read. Uh, so uh, work your way through it. You will learn a lot about antinomianism and legalism and uh, the marrow controversy there that was behind all of that. So very, very good uh, recommendation. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just think, uh, you know, we just need to be careful and not just uh, call people legalists and Pharisees, you know, if someone is focusing on the law, because a legalist and a Pharisee is simply someone who thought they could achieve the law, whereas you know, what we're doing here is saying, no, the law is higher than that because you can't. So mm -hmm. having a high view of the law says you can't achieve it. Mm -hmm. A low view of the law says you can. Mm. Very well, good. And by nature, people, people who reject the gospel do so because of some sense of moral uprightness, some sense of I'm yeah. a law abiding citizen. Yeah. I may get my I'm grandma. I'm not that bad. Right. Yeah. I'm not that bad. My grandma, you know, should be in heaven because she was good. And yeah. so there's still that appeal, and I think the moral law reveals the moral law giver, and so yeah. it's a great opportunity yeah. for us to point people to Christ. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Well, good. Well, uh, let's go to our gospel nugs for the day, and uh, Shane has our gospel nugget. Let us yeah. have it, brother. So we've been talking a lot about Jesus is the greater fill-in-the-blank <laughs> with uh, the character of the Bible, so I think we've talked about Daniel and David and uh, we did an Abigail Melchizedek. Melchizedek yeah I and mean, we've done a lot of these I'm actually going to an object for this one in our gospel nugs um, Jesus is the greater ark so we're going to Genesis chapter 6 talking about Noah and the ark um, this is probably on some children uh, bedroom walls right now Oh, it's always a strange choice uh, if we know the actual story, but we won't, right. we won't get there. Sorry if I've ruined your childhood bedroom. Um, but the ark itself is actually a great gospel nugget pointing us to Christ. So the ark was actually given, um, directed by God, constructed by Noah, and the ark was constructed with only one door. And... Uh, Similarly, we can see in the gospel that there's only one door to salvation, Christ alone. Jesus himself actually says, I am the door that you have to enter. Um, we see that the ark in uh, chapter, or, uh, chapter 6, verse 14, the ark was made of gopher wood and covered inside and out with pitch. And it was actually like a black, tarry, gooey substance that kept it waterproof. But that word pitch actually comes from the Hebrew kafar, uh, and that word also can mean here to cover, which is what it was doing, but also make atonement or make reconciliation. So much in the way the ark was covered in pitch, uh, Jesus himself covers our sins with his blood. He makes atonement. Mm -hmm. He reconciles us. Now, when you enter into the ark, much like when we enter into Christ, you are saved from the floodwaters of judgment. So God's judgment is coming for each and every one of us until we are protected, we are housed, we are saved by Christ himself, the greater ark. And so we really see here this picture of the ark um, pointing us to Jesus Christ himself. He is the true salvation from judgment. He saves us. And not only that, um, he provides us with rest. Uh, Noah's name meant rest. And our eternal rest will be found in him. Awesome. Thanks, Shane. 
Well, make sure you check out our article on Law Law, What Is It Good For? And hopefully by now you know it's actually good for a lot of things. (laughs) Until next time, keep on reforming.